Please welcome Winona Howder. Thanks so much, Claire. Well, I am thrilled to be in Berkeley for many reasons. First of all, I love being in a place where I can actually admit that I was a hippie. <laughs> in Virginia in the 60s, and while many of you were organizing the free speech movement, I was plucking chicken feathers, squishing um, potato bugs, and chopping wood for the cook stove, and trying to figure out how I could ever get to Berkeley. So it's always uh, a pleasure to be here. Plus, it's uh, uh, about 11 degrees out of my farm, and our water is frozen tonight. So I'm just really, really lucky. <laughs> so I am a big fan of the good food movement and the local food movement. Um, but it's become very frustrating to try to generate a lot of political activity. So I've been thinking about writing a book on food issues for a long time. I was out at a, an event in the Midwest in early 2011. I was writing an article on the difficulties of farming, and I was talking to some conventional commodity farmers, corn and soy, the things people grow out in the Midwest, and hearing about their, the, the difficult time that they have in making a living, especially if you don't have eight, nine hundred acres, very difficult for farmers to actually um, make even the cost of production. And one farmer in particular was telling me about how difficult it is um, at his farm and that he's about to give it up and how sad he was that he wouldn't pass it on to his children. The next day I went to a conference and I was uh, listening to a food panel and there was a well-known advocate there talking about organic food, and she was asked by someone in the audience, why is organic food so expensive? And she gave the answer that many people in the good food movement give. It's kind of a shortcut answer. Oh, it's the subsidies. And she basically said that farmers are welfare queens, and so not so, in so many words. Well, I went home the next day and I started writing an outline for Foodopoly because it's a lot more complex than that. And unfortunately today, small and mid-sized, even conventional farms, are basically barely making a living. So that's where I want to begin our discussion tonight because I'm a little bit of a contrarian and because we hear too often that the problem is just subsidies. And I'm not here to justify the subsidy system, but you know, it's obviously bad public policy, but it's, it's a symptom of a sick system. It's a band-aid that's been put over a system where there's overproduction of grains and farmers can't make a living because of the low cost, because of this overproduction. So it's really important to understand how we got here. How did we get to the subsidy system? Because I think we need to know how we got here before we can figure out where we need to go. Now we know that both liberals and right-wingers usually focus their discussion on farm policy on the subsidy issue. And they usually start by saying that only the largest farms get the subsidies. Now, you probably remember that saying that Mark Twain popularized, lies, damned lies, and statistics. Well, a close look at the USDA's numbers shows that this is exactly what's happened. One third of the 2.2 million farmers that they talk about make under, uh, they have under $1,000 in sales and two-thirds have under $10,000 in sales. These small businesses are like my good friend down the road who grows flowers. She does this as a hobby. She grows them for restaurants during the summer. She doesn't really consider herself a farmer, but she likes gardening. She makes a little bit of money. She's retired and she has an off-farm income. 
Or maybe it's like my neighbor down the road who has a, a vineyard for wine grapes. He is retired military, has a good pension, enjoys having a vineyard, makes definitely under $10,000 in sales. He has a good income outside of the farm. These people are counted in the USDA's statistics. So in reality, we only have a, just under a million full-time farmers, people who spend all of their time on the farm farming and who consider themselves actual <coughs> farmers. And 82% of them, small, medium, and the large ones, receive subsidies. Now, it is true that the largest farms receive the largest share of farm subsidies and that some politicians and urban residents also unfairly benefit because they actually own the land. Most farmers have to rent land. And after accounting for all of the costs of farming, small and medium farms netted just, un just over $19,000 from farming. And government payments, shockingly, make up half of that income. The income of full-time farmers today is 19% below the US average. One of the major problems that farmers face is the consolidation in all of industries that they depend on. Only a few firms control the market, and that means that farmers pay more for everything from fuel and equipment to fertilizer and seeds. A few major chemical and pharmaceutical giants now dominate the seed industry because they own the patents on specific crop traits. And as you probably know, Monsanto's acquired more than 60 different seed companies and controls 70% of GM corn and 99% of soybeans planted in the US. Since the economic crisis, corn and soy prices have risen 32%. And it's not just GE seeds that have skyrocketed in price. In 2013, the price of seeds is expected to jump another 7 to 10%. Farmers also sell into a very highly concentrated market with just a few firms bidding for crops and livestock. This drives down the price work that farmers actually receive. And many farmers raise livestock or crops now under contract with large agribusinesses because the few firms have so much leverage, farmers are forced to take these take it or leave it contracts that are often unfair and abusive. Additionally, because of climate change, farmers are also dealing with weather and drought and that's making it more difficult to survive. When these farms go bankrupt, or the farmer gives up trying to make a living, these small and mid-sized farms are gobbled up by the larger agribusiness enterprises. In the US, out of the just under one million farms, there are 115,000 very, very large farm, farms Many of them use contract labor. We don't want a situation where we lose more family farms to these giant farm corporations that are often integrated with the food processing companies. So we need to fix these problems now before we eliminate the support that farmers depend on. To do that, we need to really look at how we got into this situation. Starting in the New Deal, the government created programs to deal with overproduction and to create more prosperity for farm families because they'd suffered so much during the Depression. Overproducing crops has always been the bane of farmers because it drives the price down below the cost of production. And in the past, it's been supply management programs that stop this problem. This, is, this addresses the problem of individual farmers trying to grow as much as possible to squeeze as much money as they can out of their land and equipment in an attempt to at least break even. When all the producers do this, we overproduction is rampant, and then the prices drop. And when the prices drop so low that farmers can't stay in business, 
They sell out, as I said before, to larger producers. And that's what's led to the concentration of farmland into the hands of these big agribusinesses. So in 1942, several businessmen and an expert in advertising and consumer research put together a business organization that played a very powerful role in shaping the post-World War II economy and society, not just agriculture, although they played a very significant role in agriculture. It was called the Committee for Economic Development. It was a place where the leaders of business could hammer out their differences on economic policy and then use this new science of public relations to actually promote their agreed upon agenda. And among the founders of this organization were Paul Hoffman, who was the president of Studebaker, William Benton, who was the inventor of modern consumer research and polling, and Marion Folsom, uh, who was an Eastman Kodak executive. <laughs> and eventually, most of the titans of industry joined this Committee for Economic Development, the <coughs> CED for short. It ended up representing industry, banks, railroads, the grain traders, and other corporate interests. And one of their agendas was to, and this is a quote, get those boys off the farm and to create a cheap labor pool for industry. So immediately after the CED was formed, they began mapping out this post-war program to expand chemical intensive agriculture and to grant industrial and financial interests more control over it. And they had another agenda beyond these cheap commodities and the cheap labor that they wanted for factories and manufacturing. The leaders of the CED also feared the political power of farmers. Because as we all know, until the New Deal, farmers had been on this economic roller coaster for decades. And they were the political force that was on the vanguard of populism and protest against the abuses of big business. And they were also joining with labor, um, getting involved in elections. They, they were a political force to be reckoned with. So the CED didn't relish the idea of an educated and prosperous rural population having political power, especially as these men came back from World War II. Now, I'm not suggesting that this was some kind of wild conspiracy. This is simply people of like mind and like class talking to one another and acting in what they perceived as their self-interest. And you know, obviously, many, maybe some of these men actually thought it was in the best interest of the nation. We can give them the uh, benefit of the doubt. <laughs> um, these men represented disparate economic interests, and they were technocrats. They viewed the, view, the world through an urban lens, and their definition of reforming agriculture meant substituting capital for farm labor and replacing small farms with large, vertically integrated ones that could supply the food companies with the needed raw materials. And in fact, when the anthropologist Walter Goldschmidt published a report about how communities with more small and moderate-sized farms had higher overall incomes and education levels and more civic and social organizations, the U USDA actually suppressed those findings, and that study was actually burned in the streets here in California. So after World War II, uh, the USDA began also embracing the agenda uh, that was the same as the CEDs. A uh, USDA report noted that of the existing 6 million farms, 2.5 million did not meet the agency's production criteria. And the agency's goal was to direct the surplus manpower into more productive non-agriculture activities. 
So the CED and the business, business interests that they represented lobbied really hard against the New Deal farm programs in the 1940s. And they began to successfully chip away at the programs in the 1950s during the Eisenhower administration. Of course, this was the age of red baiting. And so it was easy to start discrediting farm programs and farmers. In 1962, the CED published a report that was prepared by 50 influential business leaders and 18 economists from leading universities. It was called an Adaptive Program for Agriculture, and it laid out a plan for drastically reducing the number of farmers so as to create a labor pool for industry. This would be accomplished by getting people out of agriculture before they were committed to it as a career. It recommended stopping the promotion of agriculture and vocational training, re-educating rural young men for jobs in industry, and pro providing help for these young men to relocate to places where there were factories and where there were new skills needed. It advocated the complete removal of the programs that prevent overproduction and that allowed farmers to make a living on par with urban workers. The report said that these policies would result in fewer workers in agriculture working a smaller number of farms of much greater average size. This 1962 CED report also included a vision for the globalization of food production through a free trade agenda. And in 1964, the CED released a report, Trade Negotiations for a Better Free World Economy. This became a roadmap that led to the World Trade Organization and the bilateral trade agreements that are still being negotiated today. The CED report said restrictions to world trade prevent the free flow of goods services, and capital from where they are available and to where they are needed. This obstruction prevents efficiency. We're always hearing about efficiency uh, in the use of the world's human and material resources. Now, it took more than 30 years for the CED to actually achieve their goal to eliminate the New Deal programs that prevented overproduction and enabled farmers to make a living. And it was actually during the Clinton administration, just after the US joined the World Trade Organization, that the very controversial 1996 Farm Bill passed. It was known as Freedom to Farm. Farmers were quickly calling it Freedom to Fail. <laughs> And to line up with the requirements for joining the WTO, this legislation completed the deregulation that had begun in the 1950s and continued through the 1960s and 70s. It stopped all government intervention in commodity markets. The most immediate result of that legislation was the dramatic increase of commodities like corn and soy. Crop prices plunged. The 1999 price of corn was 50% below the 1996 level. Soy was down 41%. Farmers were in major economic distress. And you can amaze, uh, imagine the pressure of Congress. And many of you may remember that period of history. So rather than doing something about overproduction, uh, the policymakers, members of Congress, didn't address the primary cause of overproduction, which was deregulation. Instead, Congress used taxpayer money to keep farmers afloat. Emergency payments were instituted in 1998. These payments were made permanent in 2002. Thus, the subsidy system was born. And so who are the main beneficiaries of this system? It's the food and the meat industry and the grain traders who are the real winners. So it's not the actual subsidies that are the source of the savings for these industries. 
The subsidies just quell the political problems for, for Congress in times when prices are low. But it's the actual lower price and the price volatility that benefits the grain traders and these industries. Removing the federal policies that kept overproduction in check and commodity prices stable made grain prices plummet and it actually increased the profitability of producing junk food and of raising animals on factory farms. Researchers at Tufts University estimate that the soft drink company saved a billion dollars during about the first seven years. They estimate that the large meat companies saved nearly four billion dollars on animal feed between 1997 and 2005. This was the, the period when industrialized animal feeding operations, uh, their number really shot up. So obviously it's had the opposite effect on farmers, and it's only the very large farms that can be profitable. The share of the retail dollar that went to farmers before 1984 was 35 cents. Today, the average share of the retail food dollar that goes to farmers is 15 cents. And for commodities like corn and soy, it's much, much lower. Let's look at corn-heavy products as an example. Farmers receive four or five cents from the sale of a box, from the large box of corn flakes. They make two or three cents from the sale of a full-size bag of corn chips. And the content of a soda in the form of high fructose corn syrup nets the farmer just under two cents out of each consumer dollar. The commodity price, though, really constitutes such a tiny share of the final retail price of food that it's almost negligible. So it's easy to blame farmers for junk food, but the main drivers and winners from our current food system are the multinational industries that trade commodities or use them as ingredients in food. And let's think about how the typical American eats. 90% of the food budget goes towards buying processed food. I mean, that is a really shocking statistic. 84% of Americans feed their children at a fast food restaurant at least once a week. And when you get down to the reasons that people eat a diet of processed food, it's basically that companies have hijacked the American taste bud. They've created food products that are actually addictive. And it's been very well documented by uh, people like the former Surgeon General David Kessler that the food industry scientists actually use fat, sugar, and salt to design processed foods that act in the brain's reward center like tobacco or other addictive substances. And this is one of the reasons that Americans are hooked on processed food even though there are many recent studies that show a relationship between processed food and cancer. And we all know they also use billions of dollars in slick advertising to convince consumers to buy their products. And this is especially pervasive with children. Over the course of a year, a child is exposed to about 5,000 TV ads for junk food. Today, the average child between 2 and 18 drinks twice as much soda and one-third less milk than in 1970. And we know that children play a major role in deciding what foods are purchased at the grocery store. Now, I'm wondering if any of you have ever bought these, any of these products. I know I have. Pepsi, Gatorade, Tropicana, Lipton Tea, Sierra Mist, Mugs Root Beer, Amp Energy, Sobe Drinks, Aquafina Water, Naked Juice, Captain Crunch, Quaker Cereal, Aunt Jemima's Pancakes, Puffed Wheat, Rice Aroni, Lay's Potato Chips, Sun Chips, Cheetos, Tostitos, Cracker Jacks, Hickory Sticks, Doritos, or Ruffles. Now, what the consumer probably doesn't realize is that all of those particular brands and many more that I didn't mention are actually owned by the very largest 
food company in the country, and it's the second largest food company in the world, Pepsi. And we are being very generous to call Pepsi a food company. <laughs> Pepsi had 64 billion in sales and 6.4 billion profits in 2011. Or the consumer might buy a Nestle product. These include Gerber, Power Bar, Coffee Maid, Carnation, Toll House, and 6,000 other products. I won't name them all. Uh, Nestle had 94 billion in sales and 10.5 billion in profits. 50% of all groceries in the US. Walmart leads the pack, followed by Kroger, Costco, and Target. And in many, many markets, these stores dominate 70 to 90 percent of sales, leaving consumers with almost no choices. So these extremely large multinational companies extend their political and economic power through a web of business, social, political, and organizational connections. For instance, the top 20 food companies have 436 shared board members playing decision-making roles in multiple venues. The food industry often speaks with one voice to cajole, to threaten, and unduly influence Congress, the regulatory agencies, and increasingly international institutions. The funding they provide to uh, universities, guides, and defined scientific research, and it's the basis for most of the regulatory <laughs> decisions regarding food. And we all know that the food industry has partnered with the biotech industry, which has also become <coughs> so powerful that it can literally buy public policy, spent more than a half billion dollars over a 10 year period on lobbying and campaign contributions. Uh, food and Water Watch did a report on this lobbying there are 100 biotech lobbying firms uh, and in Washington. They've hired 13 members of Congress and 300 former staffers for Congress and the White House, if we wonder why um, um, the GE industry has such an easy time getting their products approved. So we all know that biotechnology is just a giant experiment, and nobody really knows what the long-term unintended consequences will be. And it's been allowed to move forward without any adequate regulation. So today, we see that Walmart is partnering with Monsanto to create new markets for genetically engineered crops. This is things like the sweet corn. Monsanto is aiming for 40% of the sweet corn crop. And it needs Walmart to help accomplish this. Um, many activist organizations have tried to put pressure on Walmart not to commercialize this product. And it's one of the first GE products that's not an ingredient of a processed food. It's the actual food that's going to be on your dinner plate. And it's one of the reasons that it's so important that this battle over labeling genetically engineered food continues and is successful. Now, we've heard some food advocates say that Walmart can re-regionalize the food system. They're so big that they can actually play a beneficial role. Well, I have to beg to differ. Walmart's tremendous size probably has more to do with consolidating the food chain than almost any other factor today. One out of three grocery dollars in the US goes to Walmart. And in 2012, its total sales were um, almost $444 billion. Its profits were uh, almost $37 billion. And the Walmart heirs are worth more than the bottom 40% of Americans. I don't think this is the kind of world that we want to live in. Walmart's model is um, not positive. Overall, it's had the opposite effect. It continues to put pressure on its suppliers to cut costs. And with Walmart as their bigger customer, even these food companies like Pepsi and Coke, General Mills, 
They have to bow over and comply with what Walmart wants. It's more than just size and market share, too, that enables them to exert such market power. Uh, their logistics and distribution model, as many of you probably know, is different from other companies. And it's essentially all about sucking the money out of the supply chain. chain. It's logistical operations are run through shifting the cost and responsibilities to its suppliers. So to do business with Walmart, a company has to comply with and use all of Walmart's IT systems, their monitoring, um, inventory rules, and all of this is the responsibility of the company, not Walmart. Contracts with Walmart are non-negotiable, and Walmart, most of all, demands volume. It sells an incredible amount of each food product, and it prefers dealing with large suppliers. All of this talk about dealing with local suppliers is just another form of greenwashing. For instance, the company buys one billion pounds of beef each year, and it wants to deal with a few large meat packers rather than the small local suppliers. Not to mention that smaller companies can't meet and afford Walmart's technological requirements. So as Walmart looks for new markets in urban areas, the company has embarked on this very ambitious public relations campaign. And we know Michelle Obama um, helped them last year. But the reality just doesn't live up to the hype. Their model is based on practices that take money away from farmers, workers, and processors. And Walmart and the food processors were some of the biggest advocates for outsourcing food production. These companies find it much more advantageous to produce and process food for the developing world because it's um, the cheaper labor and the weaker environmental regulations, the more compliant governments, and the, also the opportunity to open new markets for junk food. And the trade agreements have had just a massive impact on our food system. After the agreements enforced by the WTO went into effect and a trade deal with China was approved, China became one of the, one of the five largest exporters of fruits and vegetables to the US for processing. Imports have displaced domestic production in the produce aisle and contributed to the decline in farms. Even here in California, that is true. Imported produce is more likely to have been produced with dangerous pesticides and food safety issues are a continuing problem. I spent some time in the Central Valley writing this book, and I learned that only the very largest packers and shippers can survive today, and they all have international operations. It's the only way that they can do business and actually make a profit. Since the liberalization of trade policy, the corporations that source globally can provide those very large quantities of organic fruits and vegetables required by stores like Walmart or Whole Foods and other large players in the grocery industry. So unsurprisingly, the outsourcing of organic production has helped transform the organics industry as well. And it's helped facilitate the same kind of consolidation that we see in conventional foods. And um, the result is that the 14 of the 20 largest food companies that dominate the 14 of the largest 20 food companies also dominate the organics industry. Those are General Mills, Kellogg's, Kraft, Dean, Coke, Pepsi, and ConAgra. And as the industries become more consolidated, the companies have lobbied to weaken the organic standards. And that's one of the things. We may have problems with the organic standards. It's not perfect, but we certainly don't want to see its integrity further weakened. Among the things that they've successfully lobbied for 
is using non-organic and synthetic additives to foods labeled organic, designating synthetic ingredients as non-synthetic, allowing some antibiotics to be used in food production, and allowing synthetic additives in organic infant food. So I think it's appropriate that we talk about whole foods, since John Mackey is on a PR trip and we're putting his foot in his mouth quite often. Um, whole Foods dominates the organics, the retail sale of organics. And over the past 20 years, it's acquired all of its national competitors. The fact that the Federal Trade Commission allowed Whole Foods to acquire its closest competitor, Wild Oats Market, uh, it just is proof that the agency uh, has never seen uh, a merger or acquisition that it doesn't love. And part of what Whole, Whole Foods actually sells is a type of ambiance. And fitting organic products into a gourmet slot is part of their marketing strategy. So it's increasingly begun to sell conventional foods, the very same foods that you find at the grocery store. But this is a really sneaky practice because when people go to Whole Foods, they think that the product's been screened and that it's somehow better just because it's been purchased there. Uh, for instance, most of the meat sold at Whole Foods is under their five-tier global animal partnership. And in most parts of the country, um, the meat is from the lowest tiers. I see it's from a higher tier here in uh, uh, the Bay Area. I walked through one of the Whole Foods stores. I was curious about uh, how they're marketing here. But in the uh, store down the block from my office in D.C., um, they are selling um, one and two and three tiered meat. And there's a very low entry level uh, for these products. And in fact, the uh, animals can be raised on feedlots. Uh, it doesn't require that slaughter plants be audited and animals can be transported without rest, feed, or water for up to 25 hours. So, you know, these self-regulatory systems and these uh, voluntary label, labeling systems are really all about uh, marketing more than they're actually about maintaining the quality of the food. So, one of the things that I want to examine is what John Mackey um, the, obviously, the CEO of Whole Foods is saying about the cost of food. I, I was really disturbed by what he was saying this week in an interview with the New York Times. He said that people are paying 7% of their income on food. He said, quote, people are historically not well informed about food prices. I mean, let's talk about being condescending. <laughs> he was referring with the 7% to food eaten at home, and this is taken from the USDA. The USDA uses 9% and it counts food eaten out as well as food eaten at home. And I'm afraid this is a, another case of lies, damp lies, and statistics. Both of these figures um, are very misleading because they include as income employer-paid health benefits and pension plans as income. I mean, that, I don't think that's disposable income. It includes Medicare funding, uh, food stamps or the SNAP program, and WIC funding, women, infant, and children. And it artificially raises the income and lowers the percentage spent on food. And, and then it's an average as well, so it doesn't look individually at, at what different classes of people are spending on food. You know, I think most of us know that food isn't becoming cheaper because it isn't. The same dollars are actually buying less today. The food companies are actually shrinking the package amounts uh, and increasing prices at the same time. And food inflation has significantly outpaced overall inflation over the past uh, decade, and it's even worse since the recession. Consumer food prices have gone up more than 3% every year over the past decade. Those are statistics from the uh, Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics. 
Food price hikes have exceeded also the typical wage and salary increases, at least for non-supervisors, and that's most of the population. And most importantly, these figures ignores the significant income disparity and the growing stratification that we have in this, com uh, in this country. Now, in the important point about the cost of organic and so-called natural food is that Whole Foods sources its organic and natural products through an arrangement with the largest and most powerful uh, distribution company or distribution of organic food in the country. And this is a company that most people have never heard of, even though it plays such an important part in our diet. It's called United Natural Foods Inc. <coughs> and unfortunately, distribution is one of the least transparent aspects of the organics industry. Uh, this company, UNFI for short, is publicly traded, and it dominates the distribution of natural and organic foods. It has no national competitor. Uh, it carries something like 40,000 products and supplies more than 17,000 retail outlets uh, nationwide. Now, workers at UNFI's, um, one of their big warehouses, were on strike in December and are still in negotiations. The National Labor Relations Board is currently investigating them for 45 violations of federal labor law. The charges include allegations that UNFI engaged in worker surveillance, intimidation, retaliation, that it refused to bargain in good faith, and is illegally reassigning bargaining unit work. And it's this lack of a competitive distribution system that's driven so many co-ops and smaller natural food stores out of business. You know, you're so fortunate to live here in the Bay Area where you actually have other choices than Whole Foods and you have a, a really vibrant food market. This just isn't the case in most parts of this country. And UNFI is one of the major um, companies, or it is the major companies, that's had such a chilling effect on the ability of natural food stores small co-ops and small organic restaurants to survive. I was doing a book signing in a, a town in West Virginia a couple of weeks ago, and a local deli supplied the, the treats. And I was told by the owner that in the last year, his costs have gone up 7% because of the uh, increasing prices at UNFI. Now, UNFI's revenues had increased 83% in the last five years, and it's maintained an average profit margin of 18% during this time. It's become a publicly traded company. Unify's most recent financial statements disclose that its income increased 20% 20, um, 20 in the fourth quarter of 2012. So uh, I guess this is conscious capitalism, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think we have to ask ourselves, just how did these companies get so big and so powerful? And I'm afraid that it's one of the Reagan administration's lasting legacies. His agency appointees did everything possible to dismantle the regulatory system that is necessary for ensuring fair and competitive markets. And unfortunately, since that time, no president has been willing to deal with antitrust issues. And we hear nothing about it in this country. We certainly don't hear anything about it regarding food. So even though all the rhetoric in our country is about, our, in our, is about the economic system being competitive, all the laws have been changed to allow massive con concentration of industries through these mergers and acquisitions. And today it's basically public policy to promote this kind of consolidation. And that's really at the core of the dysfunction of our food system. If we're really going to have a healthy food system, we're going to have to break up the, the foodopoly. And we can't allow the marketplace to be controlled top to bottom by just a few, a few companies. 
This means building real political power and working to reclaim our democracy. I think the two go hand in hand. And to do this really requires having a, a long-term vision of the kind of world that we want and fighting for it. You know, in our work at Food and Water Watch, we really find that people are really tired of just kind of advocating for the best we can get, the best that's politically possible. They want a longer-term vision. We need to lay out the longer-term vision and talk about the kind of world that we really want. And we know that the issues around food are inspiring large numbers of people. We need those people not just to vote with their, vote, with their fork, we need them to vote with their vote and then to hold those elected officials accountable or we won't have any democracy left. And we need to start talking about the deeper structural issues that are causing the dysfunction, not just of our food system, but really of our society. We need the public interest community to stop being afraid of actually speaking out about the kind of world that we want. We need the public interest community to stop letting big foundations actually dictate what kind of programs and campaigns we have. Because let's face it, these are institutions that don't benefit from really changing society. And you know, obviously we have to start out with small parts of this long-term vision. And one of the things that we need here in California, because I realize that you're leaders are better in California than in most of the rest of the country. But we need the thought leaders of the good food movement, who are largely here in Nor Northern California, to actually start talking about the deeper problems with our food system. To stop just talking about, oh, it's subsidies and that we can have a farmer's market and increase farmer's markets and CSAs and, and this is going to actually solve the problem bottom up. We need the, the bottom up to be grassroots action, political action. The local food movement's great. It's great to eat locally. It's wonderful. We all benefit from it if we're able to participate. But don't we want a world where everybody has access to healthy and affordable food? And if we're going to have that, we have to start fighting for what we actually want. We need to ask for things like, we need Congress, we need to start demanding that Congress actually do a study of how the lack of competition has affected the food system, both farmers and eaters. I'm just gonna name a few of the things that are, that are um, things that we could do in this next six months or so. We all know that the Farm Bill is the largest piece of farm and food legislation, and that it, it comes around about every five years, and it dictates everything from um, food, the food stamp program to the commodity program and the programs that help farmers transition into organics. No farm bill passed in the last Congress, even though it was debated for two years. A bill passed in the Senate, the House, with its dysfunction, uh, could never decide on a bill. So at the last minute, in a very undemocratic process, Vice President Biden and Senate Minority Leader McConnell, they sat down over the holidays and wrote their own farm bill, which was um, basically, fortunately, the, the food stamp program, or SNAP, was included. They, they took the 2008 farm bill and included uh, the commodity programs. They cut out a lot of the positive programs. We're going to have an opportunity to fight uh, over the Farm Bill again in this year's and next, it probably will take another two years to pass a Farm Bill. We need to talk about more than subsidies. We need a competition title in the Farm Bill. Maybe we can't get it with this Farm Bill, but if we don't start agitating for it, we'll never get it. And we need to re-establish re some of those common sense programs like the grain reserve. I mean, isn't it kind of crazy with climate change, with the adverse weather, that we have an oil reserve and we don't have a grain reserve? Mm -hmm. We need set-aside programs to, to take marginal land out of production. Farmers need a price floor. They shouldn't get the cost of producing their crops. We need to stop being afraid to ask, actually ask for the things we want. And we all know that if we don't save farms, there's going to be 
a, just a terrible toll taken on the ecology of this country beyond the food system. Because what we see today is that rural areas are becoming sacrifice zones where companies are going in for resource extraction, fracking, or even building prisons. This is not what we want our rural areas of our country to look like. And so we're at a critical point where we need to save farms and increase the income in these rural communities that have been just devastated. So I know that if we join together and actually start organizing, and really it's going to take organizing in every state across this country, at the local and the, the regional level, in every congressional district, we need people to actually become politically active again, to get away from their television screens, and to go out into the community and actually do politics, to hold the Democratic, uh, um, Democratic Party responsible for the, the rhetoric can sometimes be good, but we actually need action, and we need to hold these leaders accountable, and it really needs to begin in the local level. That's how the right wing started out, taking over school boards. We know that we have an unbroken history in this country of organizing for social change. We've seen it in issue after issue. It took 50 years to stop child labor in this country. We can dramatically change things. Saving the food system should be part of saving our democracy. And I know if we work together, we can actually do this. We can't give up. We can't say it's too hard. We have to take on these larger structural issues. And we look forward in engaging in this together. So thanks. So much.